Hi there. Thank you for joining us for this online celebration of Juneteenth and the bravery and ingenuity of every enslaved person who fought long and hard to gain freedom in the United States. The program is brought to you by the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Public Programs Department, and live from NYPL. Benny Lou Hamer, organizer, activist, and leader in the Black Freedom Movement told us, there are two things we should all care about. Never to forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. That sounds like Juneteenth to me. That sounds like the Schomburg Center, and I'm so glad to share this afternoon with you. My name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. The Schomburg Center is physically located in Harlem, New York, and is part of the New York Public Library. Our mission over the last 95 years has been in service of preserving Black life and culture. We are a public archive home to over 11 million items that help tell the multitude of stories about being Black in the United States, as well as across the globe. Some collections that you might be familiar with are James Brown or Lorraine Hansberry. We have a little Maya Angelou and many others who help to tell the rich tapestry of Black life and Black history, names that you know and some names that you don't, but all help to tell the story of Black in America, Black in the world. Our physical facilities remain closed due to COVID-19. However, I invite you to visit our digital offerings. You can, find the you can find them at the Schomburg's website at schomburgcenter.org. Also, you can find an archive of digital programming on livestream.com slash Schomburg Center. But you can find many materials that are helpful in today's world. Uh, and they're easily found at the, at the library's website at nypl.org, specifically nypl.org slash Juneteenth 2020. There you'll find some things that we recently published like our Black Liberation Reading List for adults, listing 95 titles, which is also in honor of our 95th anniversary that we are celebrating this year as well as next. <clears throat> we also just released a Black Liberation Reading List for young readers with 64 titles. So there's something there for everyone in the family. I also invite you to visit the digital collections. There you can search the Lapita Center, which is home to a collection of rare books and other printed material on the Atlantic slave trade. We will place these resources in the chat for your convenience. Today I'm joined by an incredible group of scholars, musicians, culinary experts, and descendants of freedom colonies. I will introduce them throughout the program. As communities come together to actively protest and educate themselves and each other on systematic racism, unjust laws, and the myriad of state-sanctioned aggressions and violence against marginalized people, let me take this moment to thank Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi for giving us this 21st century battle cry, Black Lives Matter, because they do. To the organizers and activists who ensure the embers for social justice never cool, to the artists and scholars and educators and photographers and journalists who document moments and movements that help us make sense of it all. And for every ally and co-conspirator who agitate the status quo to end state-sanctioned violence, bigotry, transphobia, sexism, racism, and more, I say thank you. History thanks you. This is for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony Dade, Reese Taylor, Emmett Till, Rhea Milton, Trayvon Martin, Dominique Remy Fells, Ahmed Aubrey, Rakia Boyd, and the many names we know in those history has never recorded. In the notes for a recent exhibition, Subversion, that we hope we will be able to open at some time later this year or maybe even next, it was curated by Dr. Michelle Commander, who is the director of the Schomburg Center's Lapita Center. She wrote, in 1791, the abolitionist William Wilberforce gave a speech before the British House of Commons declaring that every that great responsibility came along with the awareness of slavery's cruelty. He ended his speech with the declaration, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. We can never again look away and say that we did not know. This year marks the 155th anniversary of Juneteenth, its recognition has grown from its regional roots 
in and around Galveston, Texas, to its national imprint, made even more prominent by the uprisings across our nation. Many are calling today a National Day of Action, an education, as well as rest and community. So today we'll begin our program with soprano Brittany Renee Robinson, whose voice was hailed by the South Florida classical for its luminous tones, a seasoned opera professional. Recently, Brittany was a company member in the Metropolitan Opera 2019-2020 season's production of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Please welcome Brittany Renee live from the Bronx. Hey, Novella, thank you so much for that amazing introduction and happy Juneteenth, everyone. The selection I would love to present to you guys holds a special place in my heart with all the injustices that are happening within the world, as well as all the worries that the pandemic, the COVID has, you know, put upon us. Sometimes you feel like there is never an end in sight, but deep down you continue the fight no matter what. You just can continue to keep fighting because you know the outcome will be much better from where you started. This is Stand the Storm by Timothy Amukele. I hope you enjoy. Stand the storm, it won't be long. You will anchor by and by. Stand the storm, it won't be long. You will anchor by and by. Stand the storm, it won't be long. You will anchor by and by. Stand the storm, it won't be long. You will anchor by and by. Your ship is on the ocean, you will anchor by and by. Your ship is on the ocean, you will anchor by and by. You're heading for the kingdom, where you'll anchor by and by. You're heading for the kingdom where you'll anchor by and by. Your mother's in the kingdom, you will anchor by and by. Mother's in the kingdom where you'll anchor by and by. Stand the storm, it won't So next up, we'll have a chef, cookbook author, and television personality, Carla Hall, who is pure sunshine. She graced the Schomburg stage in 2017 to interview the renowned food historian, Dr. Jessica B. Harris, and I am delighted that she is joining us to share the influence of Juneteenth and the impact of Black Lives Matter on her own life. You may be familiar with her cookbooks, 
She has conducted research for her most recent book, Kala Hall, Soul Food, Every Day and Celebration here at the Schomburg Center. She actually perused our collection of menus, which I do believe some of those menus might be available in our digital collection. So it's giving you another reason to visit us at SchombergCenter.org. Following Carla, we will have a conversation with Dr. Andrea Roberts, founder of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. The project documents Black settlement heritage and grassroots preservation practice among descendants of these historic communities founded by, Af by African Americans in Texas from 1866 to 1930. Dr. Roberts will be joined by Fred McRae and Larethia Clay, descendants of two freedom colonies, and moderator, chef, and culinary historian, Grace Nelson. But first, please welcome Paula Hall. Hello, how are you, Novella? I'm well, thank you. Thank you again for being here. Look, I couldn't come on without giving a toast to Juneteenth. This is a watermelon and strawberry slushy with a little bit of lime and mint. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so you mentioned that I had done a lot of research for the Schomburg and it's amazing how much we don't know about our culture because we just don't get it in schools. And I, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and it wasn't until I became the culinary ambassador at the Sweet Home Cafe in at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So I was thirsty for so much information. And speaking of menus, I want to share the menu that I have in my book, Carla Hall Soul Food for Juneteenth. So we start out with watermelon juice or this delicious slushy. And then there is a tomato, cucumber, and dill salad, a succotash salad with corn and lima beans, red cabbage and beet slaw with a horseradish and ginger dressing. I took some, I took some creative liberties here a piri piri poussin or Cornish game hens, um, watermelon salad with radishes, buttermilk biscuits, and ending with a strawberry cake. And so, so much of our culture comes through food and understanding the connection to food and that our story has woven through Africa and the Caribbean, um, as well as the United States, also in Spain, hence the piri piri. And the more that I learned about my culture, the more that I want, I felt so much pride. And one of the things that I was doing in Carla Hall Soul Food is to show that there are the celebration dishes because every culture has them, but also the everyday dishes. And there were a couple of times where I was talking to other black people and they're like, oh, you know, I, I don't eat too much soul food because it is, it's gonna kill you. And I was like, well, the celebration dishes, but that's just it. The menu that I mentioned is a celebration menu, but you, you don't eat like that every day. I mean, the Italians don't eat meatballs and lasagna every day. You know, so it's understanding that our cuisine is an agrarian cuisine and that there's so many grains and vegetables and deliciousness that we pull in the piri piri, I mean, the, um, the millet, and the um, sorghum, which I love, and it's so nutty. So these are these are grains that I that I got to know, and then I started using them and started making salads with them, and they're so delicious. And so it's all about balance. And the other thing that um, I, I want to mention, whenever I talk to people about soul food, and I see it written in articles, is that soul food isn't capitalized. So if you have any other cuisine, they will be capitalized. Italian food is capitalized because it's also the culture from that country. Well, we as Africans or Caribbeans who are here and African-Americans, the black people, we don't have that country to connect to. So when soul food came about in the late 60s and 70s, you know, you, you think it should be capitalized because it is the cuisine of our culture. And so I've really pushed forward to try and have um, that perspective about our food. And there, there's another dish in the book that's one of my favorites. It has nothing to do with Juneteenth, but it is shrimp and grits. And when I speak to my friends um, in South Carolina, 
um, and talk about, you know, just the beauty of that shrimp and, and the grits. So the grits don't have a lot of milk and um, cream and cheese. You have these beautiful grits that are showcased with salt and pepper and a bay leaf. And then you have these beautiful shrimp because you want the shrimp to sing, you want the shrimp to shine. And the shrimp is with peppers and onions and it is just really delicious. And when you put the two together, you have a little bit of that tomato and peppers and onions and, and then those beautiful shrimp over those clean tasting grits. And it's surprisingly delicious. So when you strip back all of the stuff and all of the fanfare and, and all of the I guess the celebration of it, because it makes it an everyday dish, there it's so much beauty to our food. And I've just been enjoying um, discovering myself through food. And I think that food is the ultimate diplomacy. So when you sit down with somebody and you share your culture with them, it is, it is like ground zero because you can accept this offering and this fellowship, which is so incredibly beautiful. And I continue to do it every day. And I continue to invite people to the table. And with that, I want to invite another person to the table whom I think is so amazing. She is a chef and a historian. It is Therese Nelson. She is so passionate about sharing our culture through food. And she will be introducing the next panel. Therese, back to Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, yeah, Novella's right. You are absolute sunshine. And there's so much about what you just talked about in terms of finding yourself. And when we were thinking about what this panel was really going to be about, um, the world of colonial history and history in general really allows us to think of the lens through which we sort of view ourselves. Um, so much clearer. So I'm excited to be here. Um, be here this afternoon. Um, I want to introduce um, Dr. Angie Roberts. Um, about five years ago, we were convened in Austin, Texas for an event called Soul Summit. Um, it was, you know, 2015, the 150th anniversary of Juneteenth. Um, this just really particular point um, in history. And Tony T. Martin had this thought about context, right? She just thought of, about all of these food folks that she'd been talking to and celebrating with and um, convening with all over the country for the whole of her career. Um, the Juneteenth, this particular Juneteenth, was this really particularly perfect moment to start anew, to sort of convene in a way that was in the spirit of Juneteenth, in the spirit of family reunion, in the spirit of all of those tenants that really f sustain us and um, kind of keep us forward moving and all of the challenges that we sort of have. And so this, the ends of guys of sort of a food focused event, um, I mean, two days of just fellowship, but there was a panel at the end that I had the honor of being on with Dr. Roberts. And again, my lens that I do my work through is certainly through the lens of history. When you find yourself in history, it changes the posture with which you do your work, whatever discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and so the panel was full of folks from different disciplines, poets, um, and Dr. Roberts was superlative on his panel. And the work that she was doing was really thinking outside the box with reference to food, right? You can't talk about food without land. You can't talk about um, posture or sort of um, agency in any space you occupy without thinking about land and being specific about what that means. And so she, introduced what at that point was a relatively new project called the Texas um, Freedom Colonies Project. And it just, it stuck out to me as a really beautiful way to, to always come back to center and always sort of come back to those tenants that are gonna sustain whatever work you're doing in whatever discipline. So um, we met through the, the, the lens of food, but yes. I feel like the Freedom Colonies have kind of sustained this relationship. They have. And the food is really what uh, brought me into this work because one of my earliest memories in a freedom colony is staying with my great grandmother and she lived in Riceville community and that was where she had a chicken farm. So this is notable because there's no sign that says Riceville, there's a church, 
but there's no sign that says Riceville. And as a child, I just knew I was going to great grandma's house and I was gonna get the best tasting chicken I've ever had and have had since. And mm -hmm. what I found um, in looking back at that time is I remember independence. My great grandma went to the grocery store for one or two or three things, <laughs> but everything else she was growing in her garden and she raised those chickens and they were on the table uh, for lunch. And she owned the land and it was always one of the most joyous memories I have associated with my childhood. But I didn't know it then as being about a free black space as I would call it now. But it was that memory and returning back to that as I began to lose more and more people in my family and get a consciousness that people won't be around you forever. And mm -hmm. I began to go to cemeteries and, and just commune with the ancestors. And I had a real realization that that sense of freedom and independence, uh, the more I researched about why she was that way and that she was part of a mutual aid society in three different, that would stretch three different states called the Farmers Improvement Society. And mm. that that society had a five point platform about not relying on credit and cooperative economics. All of these principles that we try to espouse these days as being about freedom and independence for black folks. And I'm like, my great grandma was doing that. Yes. Who else was doing that? And that question, right me on this journey it was it's what part of what took me on this journey one million percent and like i feel like that's another part that is always i'm always looking to you um to help with because it becomes whenever we talk about the space of history and the sort of the the process of um recording history we, we call it lots of things right but that process is always and when it comes to our culture it's always this disparate detective work we're trying to find these pieces of evidence that sort of will let you extrapolate out li longer lines of, of, of thought. And you use a word um, on the Freedom Colonies um, website, but certainly um, I've heard you talk about it before, but just the, 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 the necessity and the specificity of evidence um, that these receipts, like these sort of cultural receipts that give you yeah. We think about sometimes I think we, we romanticize or maybe um, we think broadly about our culture and because we don't have necessarily evidenced, tangible, tactile right. um, proof in this oral history. It's all these stories that are passed down. And right. what your project does in a really important way is sort of give us these really particular receipts. Mm. Yeah, and I, I love that you call it receipts. You know, by trade, so to speak, my discipline is actually urban planning and I, you know, study urban planning, planning history, historic preservation and community revitalization and development. And very often, those are fields in which there are very specific rules about what data matters and what counts as data, mm. what counts as the truth and whose voices matter. And one of the, the enterprises that, or one of my interventions in all of those fields is about the freedom to interject and interrupt these ideas about what's valid, whose voice is valid, what, what is true evidence. And so the Texas Freedom Colonies Project is really a co-researching project because while I use the classical approaches to archival research, I also use ethnography where I'm just spending time with folks. I'm listening to folks, I'm interviewing people, I'm observing, participant observation, all of those things. But I'm also talking to people about what matters to them mm -hmm. and what makes a place a place. And what's so notable when you talk about Texas Freedom Colonies and people talk about what is the definition of these places and people try to put boundaries around it. And I often tell them, you know, so much of it is about the undocumented, undocumented belief that a place actually existed. Mm -hmm. And how do you get a hold of that? That is, that, is, that is the real question, is how do we make our invisible assets, places visible? Not just to the public and to uh, government officials, but to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's yes. really the process and the work of the project is this, this enterprise in visibility and in making that truth accessible and visible to the right people and especially focusing in on those places that are most vulnerable 
And I talk about vulnerability in the sense of those places that are endangered by chronic underinvestment, gentrification, uh, environmental injustice. There are all the ways that our communities are under attack. And very often the last communities that we recognize are those with this historic significance. That's right. They're everywhere. <laughs> the irony is they're everywhere. Because that's the other part that is it was always so fascinating to me. Because I think sometimes, again, it's sort of, um, and I, I feel like in, in some some of the more, more important ways, um, even within Black culture, we, we do this sort of um, Cliff Notes version or this sort of um, oversimplification yes. of these really complicated, really rich, really sort of these rabbit holes that really need you to, to dig, to sort of lean into. Um, yes. But I think about, I think about figures like, like, um, like Edna Lewis, right? Um, and we think about her book and her legacy, but like Freetown, what in my mind is exactly what you're talking about. It was, exactly. It was that, right? Yes. And so we know about these places that we're more familiar with, familiar with. we'll say Eatonville or Rosewood or uh, any of those types of towns, mm. Mound Bayou. However, there were so many other communities that were never officially established as formal towns but they functioned as such. They functioned right. as settlements or communities, but they had their own sense of governance. They had their central decision-making spaces. Churches doubled as places in which people's consciousness were raised about politics, as right. well as where they would sometimes register to vote and vote. So we have right. these spaces that we don't call city hall, right? but they very much function as the civic space. And so my work is very much about documenting that evidence of place in the vernacular, in the voice, in the actual circumstance of, or in the history of these places as told to me, as shared mm -hmm. through memory, as experienced, and of course, as investigated thoroughly through archival and historical research. Yes. Well, because that gets into another thought around um, the function of history historians and the sort of function of researchers in the way in which we posture that work. It feels sometimes like mm. there's a preciousness and sort of a, a I, so I think about this word of this idea of stewardship more than um, working as a historian because it feels active and it feels like you are sort of. I don't know, there's a protective nature with which you engage the stories that you're being gifted, yes. the posture you, the, the, you engage the subjects with, all of it is all wrapped up in the posture with which you, you even start to, to enter those spaces. I feel like it's such a particular way to, to, to be and to work. And I wonder how that posture's change. And, you know, I mean, you have a whole life in the academy. And I think that I would imagine that balance is so tricky when... Um, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. the ethics of the work and the ethics of the work are part of the research I do right. everything's right. part of the research I do so you know the, the the research question then is and what we want to know is how do African-American people retain control over their heritage their stories and their places while at the same time engaging the world on its own terms mm -hmm. that is how do you engage the academy uh, how do I become a conduit for the representation of these places. It is a huge responsibility. Uh, people come to me all the time and say, oh, well, you're just gonna take my stuff and give it to those white folks. And I say to them, you have to have a plan. You will not always be here. And where, who will hold it? And what can we do together to ensure that it's held in the most ethical way possible? And it makes it harder and it makes it more time consuming. Um, but it's, it's what's made the work, I think, so valuable, not just to me, but to the people I work with. Um, and it really is why I'm doing a book that's not simply about sharing stories, but it's about really focusing in on how are African Americans grassroots preservation is saving their own communities, grassroots planners that maybe don't have the degree, but they have an expertise. That's right. uh, they are doing the work. And so the book that I'm focused on, uh, or the, what I'm working on, is primarily how do we understand the best practices? How do we engage in Sankofa critically? How do we go back and get, right? Yes. How do we go back and get that which is valuable and useful, and also make an effort to do things differently, 
to be more inclusive in certain instances? How do we, you know, grow um, our circle of belonging even more than we once mm -hmm. did? And so we're at this wonderful point in which we are going back and get, but also um, being critical and bringing technology and everything else that we can to the enterprise. Absolutely. I would love to if you talk a little bit more about Sankofa because it's, it, it's, so, it's so, I think feel like it's central to your work. It's, the, it's this part of the logo for your project. It is, yes. um, it's such a, it's a theory that I think maybe gets extrapolated out too far and the real sort of mm -hmm. sense of what it really means. Um, it does. It it's does. clear, it immediately shifts the posture of everything you do. Yeah. Uh, so as I said, Sankofa, which is also the Sankofa bird that you may have seen, and it's all part, all a part of all of the materials that I use in, in our logo, uh, is about the principle of going back in the past to retrieve so that before you go forward, you're getting the knowledge you need to move forward. And very often that's turned into, we'll go back to the past and then we'll get all of the good stuff and everything in the past is the good stuff. And if we just go back to the past, everything would be fine. And it is that sense of idealism that we're also unpacking and doing this work. Mm. Um, because as we're trying to find out what's a best practice, we're finding out what makes it harder for African-Americans to save their places. Okay, what's the truth about that? The truth about that is very much what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. When we talk about George Floyd, when we talk about Breonna Taylor, we talk about systemic racism that devalues our bodies, our lives, our stories, our heritage. And some of that is internal to the community as well. So there's a reclaiming that we have to do. So yeah. I use a framework I call critical Sankofa planning in my approach to working with communities where we're thinking critically um, and differently about how we go back and get and how we involve, if we're scholars, how are we involving and and working with and side by side with communities to determine what their priorities are rather Absolutely. than determining it for them. Yes. And it, I think that's such a, a really particular distinction to make. Um, I think about um, the WPA narratives where you are having to think through who got these, who, who were the interviewers? Right. Who, how, what, you put those those evidences in we can yes. we address them by having them and you listen to these stories that are so brilliant but you do have to then wonder about how much were folks sharing how protected did they feel um in terms of sharing their stories and ultimately how do we view what is raw material without context and so you have you yes. have sort of critical as yes. you to define that early so that people have context for what they find in your research later on Yes, absolutely. And so this, this critical framework is about three things that we do as a Texas Freedom Colonies project. We record origin stories, we record stories of decline, and we record stories of ongoing struggle and triumph. And we do that through an apparatus called the Atlas online and also on paper where we collect the, sub, uh, the public stories. And then finally, uh, we collect this data not just for the sake of having data and being proud of our heritage, but how do we then deploy that link, that uh, knowledge and that data in service of saving these communities? Absolutely. How do we use that then as the basis and the foundation for research about land retention and food security and yeah. environmental justice and everything else we want to do where very often that's not seen as valid knowledge, that cultural agency is not seen as integral to the reformation and the revitalization of these communities. And my work is directly confronting that, that idea. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, Atlas is actually something that I was really, and I've been impacted by because you know, the point you made about defining place in a way that does, is not necessarily traditional is so brilliant. I just see, I see so clearly when the Atlas like is overlaid with sort of the traditional Atlas, like what that could, and will feel like so much of it i think in in the work i do certainly but definitely watching the work you're doing is how do you bring dignity to people in a way that makes them feel ownership of it and mm. it's something about, i think about when i talk to like such young young people 17 18 year olds wanting to come into this industry where they don't see themselves at all they see a very right. particular way that you're going to engage this work and all of a sudden you introduce them to verde macros and you introduce them to Tony to yeah. martin it's, like this fine straight immediately because yes. there's a sense 
I'm part, no, no, but I'm really part of this. I'm actually, I have a legacy that, that lays on top of, there's a, a coding atlas on top of the yeah. history. It's so, cool. it's so, oh, it's, it's so awesome. beautiful. It's very much about bringing everybody with you, the lift as we climb. It's, okay. it's a true thing. It's a necessary way to operate if we're on the way to liberation. That's right. Yes. Akasi forever, and there's so many things that I'm sure um, we could expand on, but I, I, I know that you have um, two guests. Um, I do. The Freedom Colonies, and I think we talk about abstractly this notion of what your project is about and its specificity of place, but whenever I meet folks who have that deep, specific connection um, to their roots in the ways that you guys do, and certainly you do, um, there's a different posture. It's a, it's a beautiful posture, and I'm, I'm so excited to to have you um, do this next part. Yes. And so, as I mentioned before, I don't do any of my work without fellow Freedom Colony descendants. And I thought, what better opportunity to talk about my work uh, in the context of Freedom Colony bottom-up grassroots preservation planning than to bring on Freedom Colony grassroots preservationists. And uh, Loretha Clay, and Fred McRae are two examples of those people. While I've mapped over 357 of these places, and we have a list of 557 that we're in total trying to document and map, these two people have been the real foundation for almost all of the work that I've done in the academy around freedom colonies. And so what I want to do today is make sure that we hear uh, a little bit about uh, where they live now and what freedom colony or colonies that they uh, are connected to. So I'll start with Loretha. Hi, Andrea. Um, my name is Loretha Clay. I live in Dallas, Texas. My freedom colony is the Shankleville community in Newton County. So if anyone is familiar with the geography of Texas, I live about five hours away from, New from Shankleville. So Dallas is in North Texas, Shankleville is in what's called Deep East Texas, which is very close to the Louisiana border on the southern side of um, mm -hmm. the southern part of Texas. Yes. And Fred? Thank you. Um, Dr. Roberts, I also live in Houston, Texas. Oh. But I have about 120 mile long routes. Mm -hmm. that drive me all the way back to East Texas and uh, drives me all the way back to East Texas mm -hmm. in the city of Jasper, in the county of Jasper, which Jasper is the county seat. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what dri drives me back and forth to Houston, to Jasper, Texas. I'm always in Jasper. So what is it about these communities that makes you keep coming back? Why do you commit so much time and effort? What is it about them that keeps you connected? Loretha? When I, when I was growing up, uh, Shankerville was just very special. My grandparents lived there and uh, my mother used to take us there on weekends all the time. And um, I know we're going to talk about the Purple Hall Peace Festival and uh, I remember, you know, my grandmother would call and say the peas are ready and we would, you know, go and spend the weekend. We spent weekends there all the time. When I got to be older, um, I would be in Dallas on a Friday. It would be a nice sunny day and I'd call my grandmother, what are you doing? She'd say, oh, oh, I'm doing nothing. I'd get in my car, I'd take the day off real quickly and go mm -hmm. visit with her. So it's just a, um, a place that just has memories of family and and fun and we have our family reunions there every year, every other year, mm -hmm. um, still have them there, even though my grandmother has been dead for 33 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's just a place of, of home and, and possibility and fun and, you know, being yourself yeah. and everyone knowing you and everyone loving you and yeah. being related to everyone that's there and just it's just a, 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 a warmth that um, is almost indescribable as to why I, I continue to cling to that feeling even today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fred, what, what keeps you going back to your community, to Dixie community? In, 1940, I mean, in 2014, uh, members of our community formed a, an organization 
called the Community and Family Historical Preservation Association. We applied for and was granted a 501c3 tax exempt status. And that organization, we were able to purchase back into the community what was once our elementary school, GW Chicago Elementary School. For many years, it was out of our, while it was located in our neighborhood, it was out of our possession. And in 2014, uh, it went up for sale and we were able to acquire it back into the community. And the gymnasium built in 1952 mm. is the home <laughs> of the Community and Family Historical Preservation Association. Awesome. Now what we do at the Community and Family Historical Preservation is we host family reunions, class reunions, cemetery homecomings, quinceaneras, and all of these things tend to bring the communities together. And another couple of projects that we have, we have also have the 4-H involved uh, mm. and a youth mm. mentorship program that yes. we also house in our, in our facility. Awesome. So with that, Loretha, can you talk about some of the big projects, uh, the ways in which you have uh, taken leadership to uh, preserve the physical assets and the uh, intangible assets of uh, Shankleville. So in 1988, we started the Shankleville Historical Society. And, um, um, and so we, it's a nonprofit 501c3 organization. And um, with, through that organization, we have um, done oral history projects. We have um, um, done cemetery um, uh, cleaning and cemetery maintenance uh, education projects. Our largest project to date, though, is uh, we have we were able to get the Odom homestead, and the Odoms were descendants of Jimmy Winnie Shankle, which I guess we can go into that history. Go ahead later. now. Go ahead now. Tell the story. <laughs> Tell the story. <laughs> so, so Shankleville is named for Jim and Winnie Shankle. And Jim, they were uh, enslaved in Mississippi uh, um, in 1800s, whatever. And uh, the story goes that uh, Winnie was given to a, um, a, a woman as a wedding present. And she and her husband came to, uh, to Deep East Texas in a county that's now uh, Newton County, which used to be in Jasper County. Jasper mm -hmm. and Newton are next door neighbor counties, just, in, just, mm -hmm. just for information. And uh, so um, uh, she came to Texas. Jim was so distraught that he, um, you know, found out where she was, ran away. We like to say swam the Mississippi River <laughs> and uh, found her at a, a um, spring in Newton County uh, and where they met. And uh, I have a cousin who's done additional research and she believes that Jim was owned by uh, the brother of this man that moved to Texas. Mm -hmm. And that's how he was able to arrange to purchase him to purchase so him. he could stay in, in Texas. And so Jim and Winnie Shanko, after emancipation, were able to acquire a league of land, which I've heard is like 4,000 acres. Um, and they, uh, along with their son-in-law, Steve McBride, and they um, just built a community and it's called Shankleville to this day. So Jim and Winnie's oldest daughter was Harriet. And Harriet married a man named Joseph Odom. And I am a descendant of the Odoms down there. So we have mm -hmm. an Odom homestead, which we were able to um, get on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, and its significance is that it is the only remaining example of a operating and a well-run farm in Newton County during the, in the 1920s to 1960s time period. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, um, A.T. Odom, my grandfather, just so happens, was a um, contractor in the area. And at the time, the Weir Longleaf Lumber Company was the largest employer in the area. And he uh, contracted with them and did carpentry work. So we were able to get on that uh, register. And right now, we, we're in the process of restoring the home to the 1945 appearance that it had. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, my cousin is there now. Um, today was supposed to be the start of our family reunion. Uh, we've been having family reunions since 1949. 
And so this was going to be a big one, 70 years, but um, um, COVID came in. So we'll talk about that yeah, later. Yeah. So Fred, you want to talk about some pre-emancipation and post-emancipation history associated with Dixie community? Because it's kind of special. I do. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, I'll start with our motto, uh, yeah. empowered by the past while focusing on the future. And I'll start with some background about prior emancipation. And I'm going to talk a lot about a gentleman named Richard Uncle Dick Seal. Mm -hmm. In about 1850, Joshua Seal and his wife moved to Jasper with a number of enslaved persons. And his plantation was established west of Jasper, Texas, near Bevelport. But Richard Uncle Dick Seal was born enslaved about 1797 in Alexandria, Virginia. And at some point, Joshua Seal became its master. Records show that Richard Uncle Dick Seal was allowed to join the Baptist church that Joshua and his family attended in Mississippi. And after arriving in Jasper, and Richard began uh, being a, a devout Christian, held church services on the beech trees. And later on, Joshua and Dick together built what is the oldest black church built by enslaved, formerly enslaved persons west of the Mississippi, Dixie Missionary, Dixie Missionary Baptist Church. So that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the background of prior to emancipation. Mm -hmm. Now after emancipation, uh, many of those formerly enslaved persons remained in Dixie community and they, uh, clustered together under the leadership of Uncle Richard Dick Seal. I want to leave you with a nugget about Uncle Richard Dick Seal, though. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you've heard about Bobby Seal, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. I think we may have. <laughs> Uncle Rich Dick Seal would be Bobby Seal's grandfather. So, mm. deep roots. <laughs> deep roots. Deep roots. So, with that, um, I really want to give you both an opportunity to speak to this unique moment and the challenges that it presents Freedom Colonies. That could be anything, but most notably, I think about COVID-19, and I think about the ongoing unrest, and I think about you know making sure young people know why it's still important to remain connected and to value the physical and the intangible assets associated with these places. How does the story in the, in the heritage help you work on those kind of big problems or contend with those? Well, in, in our case, um, every, every kid that's um, associated or connected to Shankleville knows the Shankle story. Um, it's, it's a, um, a hit. When we have our homecomings, I think Fred mentioned the homecomings, which raise money for cemeteries in the area. Um, or when we have our family reunions, we, um, there's always a trip to the spring, the spring meaning the spring where Jimmy and Winnie Shankle were reunited. Right. And uh, we always have a ritual where we um, drink the water from the spring and, and tell the story of that. Mm -hmm. And so because of the COVID-19, as I mentioned earlier, today was supposed to be be our start of our family reunion, you know, which would have included going to the spring and everything. And so what we have are trying to do is we're putting together a uh, virtual family reunion. Yes. And, uh, and that's the reason my cousin is there because he was so excited. We had have been working on the house and the way we've been restoring it is we have a um, architect who works with us, but all the work has been done by uh, my grandfather's grandsons, uh, with this cousin being the um, the head guy and the, the uh, project manager, for lack of a better term. Well, he is the project manager. Yes. <laughs> but it's being restored by um, cousins and his grandchildren and their and my co other cousins' grandchildren. So we get together, have work weekends, go up and do the work. We have a we have real contractors come in every now and then and do the work. Yeah. The reason he is there was um, he he is going to do a uh, live from Shankleville this Saturday night tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Where he is going to um, show the progress on the house because yeah. we have gotten grants, but we've also raised money within the family. 
And then he's also going to take a walk down to the spring and do mm -hmm. a, a, the traditional, um, tell the, the whole story of the spring and everything. Oh, and, um, awesome. and so we're hoping that this works out. And we have been happy that the main people planning it because our family reunions have been going on so long that they're sort of, we're like wrote, okay, Friday, we're going to do this. Right. Saturday morning at 10, this happens. 12, this happens. You know, it's sort of, everyone knows what they're doing and, and everyone knows their, what they're kind of do. So since we've had to step outside the box, the main people coming up with ideas and everything are the younger generations, or as we call them, the green shirts, because <laughs> our family reunion, um, the, uh, the, the generations are grays are my, my, my parents' generation, and my generation is blue, the next is yellow. So the kids that are in college and younger are green, and then the little kids are red. It and takes so a lot green, of work. I'm sorry? It takes, a, it takes a lot of work and organization. Right. You know, it's just not to be taken for granted, and you have right. to train younger so, generations. So the green shirts are in charge this weekend for a change, so that's going to be fun. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So Fred, um, I know that we're almost to the, the getting questions and I see we have a lot of questions. Do you want to remark it all around the great work that you've been doing with young people? Well, yeah, but I wanted to first go back to something that Larita said about COVID-19. Mm, yes. It has really affected our organization because this is the period when we will really be renting out the building for mm. these types of events that I talked about earlier. Right. And not having that source of revenue puts us in a real bind. But uh, we're going to get through it uh, mm -hmm. by the grace of God. Yes. But um, um, what we do with the youth, we have a young youth mentorship program where we meet once a month. And we usually meet with them at the same day that we meet with our poise group. And it's on the day that we have our normal executive board meeting, which is the second Saturday in each month. So we meet once a month with these groups and we're doing some exciting things. I'm proud of the youth in our community for sure. But um, mm -hmm. those are the kinds awesome. of things that we, we do with the youth. And we also working with some of them with scholarships. We had a couple of graduates this year that we're trying to help with the scholarships and don't know where they're going to school yet, but mm -hmm. uh, we are, if they're even going to be able to go, but we are trying to be prepared in case everything opens up and uh, we'll be able to do that. Yes. So uh, I know that we have questions, uh, Therese. Yes. It's, yes it's a, it's the, the comments are going off. You all are so, this is <laughs> um, uh, preserving more black communities and, and places could um, be a form of restorative justice and reparations. Um, what are some of the actions and steps to help um, make that happen. I, I think that's a really interesting question is this idea about where folks really start, right? Right. So I think a lot of it is knowing about what's available and what's accessible and also knowing about your assets. So an asset-based approach is not just about saying we have this building. It's about saying we have these individuals with this know-how. Mm -hmm. And we have people, they don't necessarily live here, but I know I have a cousin who's an attorney. Oh, we need to start a nonprofit. I have no idea how to do any of that. Where's the cousin? Okay, well, I don't have a cousin who's an attorney. Well, is there a university or a law school that wants to do some pro bono work? So it's really about being very, very resourceful, as resourceful as our ancestors were, but very often within our own communities among relatives and the greater social network, we know individuals with the know-how. We know someone who's a plumber. We know someone who uh, is a carpenter. We know people with these skills and there was a time when those are the people we depended on. On a yes. larger scale, it's really about taking um, opportunities to learn. So we have local historical, com uh, historical commissions, which are often don't have very many people that look like us on them. Uh, they do exactly. sometimes, but very often yeah. they do not. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to interrupt, interject, and uh, get involved. Absolutely. And and very often, if we don't, they're leaving money on the table that belongs to us. There's yes. different projects, there's different uh, opportunities for grants for revitalization and protection from disaster and everything else. And we find out way after the, way after the fact. And what's key is the education 
um, and access and knowing about these resources. And often it behooves us as people who educate planners and who work in planning to reach out to communities and empower them by offering them the same information and access that we have. Amen. Um, yeah, I think about that reference is with reference to um, really any work you're doing. I think sometimes in, in Black spaces, we talk about lack of support or what support should look like. And we don't think about what resources or what support could look like if we thought more broadly about what we have already in yes. community. It's so beautiful in that asset, um, reconsidering assets, that's the takeaway. Yeah. Um, this, the second question was really interesting and it was about the DNA um, and sort of um, that, that, that sort of um, DNA research is part of your work um, at all. Not at all. And I actually pay much more attention to the informal kinship networks that I've observed where people have, African Americans have their own way of talking about um, kinship. I wrote an article called uh, Count the Outside Children. And, you know, we have a way of, of belonging, of performing and exercising belonging of community and family that's beyond the biological. And while I think it's really exciting to be able to look back and say, I can look at this African ancestor and know I'm from this village. At the same time, I think what's really key is understanding those relationships in the ways that we constructed family before we even got here. Yes. And how to continue some of those kinships with people who say, oh, they were my cousin. Are they blood? No, we just call them cousin. Mm. Those kinship networks matter. Yes. And, and when I go to Loretha's homecoming, when I go to events, I meet people and some are kin and some are not. Um, but there's a bond and sense of belonging that they're able to deploy to get things done. And Absolutely. so that's what I'm a little more interested in than DNA. Absolutely. I don't really find it, um, I, I haven't really incorporated it into my own work either. Um, I, I know, I think of people like Michael Twitty, who thinks very particularly about um, the, our culinary our traditions and being yes. able to map them as far back as possible. So DNA becomes really important in that way for him. Um, but in a lot of ways, I mean, I think the, what I'm interested in is sort of the same thing you're talking about, is these, these, these points of history and heritage that will absolutely follow with you, kind of be, like envelop you, sort of be all in the marrow of your bones everywhere you go. So then you become sort of an ambassador and sort of a, you become the representation of that heritage because you value those, those, um, those assets more, more, um, more keenly and it becomes such more sort of infused into the way you move through the world. So um, yeah, I mean, it was interesting in culinary, like DNA relative to culinary work, think about um, Michael Twitty, he's, that's his life story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's his story for sure. Yes. So um, I, if it's okay, I, I see there's, there's another question. Um, I don't know that yeah. we had. Uh, I'm, for, I'm all for it. Okay. Um, uh, as churches, faith communities are often central to social life. Um, how important are they um, to the preservation of these Texas freedom colonies? And, um, and do you feel their specific roles churches have played in preservation work? Do I, either one of you want to speak to that? Uh, what was the last part of the question? Um, basically, do you in the community spaces like um, Mr. McCray talked about um, being these sort of hubs for um, preservation work? Um, do you find that churches um, have become have, are like a really interesting in particular um, hotbed of this kind of research? Are they disproportionately better at um, sort of having those records than other places? That there are in Shankerville, there are three churches: a, a Baptist church, a a um, an, um, CME church, which used to stand for Colored Methodist, now stands for Christian Methodist, mm. and and a um, uh, Church of uh, God. And when I was growing up in the '60s, and where well, the late '60s, early '70s, the churches were very vibrant and and very um, and they would um, they had you know preachers that shared congregations. So if you had Sunday school in one church then you would have church, everybody from the three churches would go to wh whichever church had, you know, 11 o'clock service. That, mm -hmm. that is not as much anymore. And the, and the congregations are a whole lot smaller than they were. I think between all those three mm -hmm. churches, there may be yes. 50 members between all, all three of them. And so they are really struggling. But when we have the homecomings, they still get together because the homecomings rotate mm -hmm. between each church. 
And so whenever the homecoming, which is always the first Sunday in August for us, then the, um, the other churches don't have church. Everyone goes to uh, that one church. So they continue to play a role, but they're, but not as, um, you know, and they continue to support what the Shankville Historic Society does and the, and the projects that we do, but they're not in the forefront like they were, you know, several mm -hmm. years ago, primarily because the community itself is not as large as it once was. Mm -hmm. And the community exactly. itself has, um, you know, uh, m mainly senior citizens in it and not as many people who are available to um, play leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And what I've observed is a challenge is that sometimes the only remaining structure in some of these freedom colonies, the way that we know they exist or still existed at any given time was because of the churches and the churches are still standing. And very often you have a 130, 140 year old church mm -hmm. and maybe a small cemetery in the back. And that's all that remains of the settlement. And the other challenge is that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was very important and we were very proud of our building funds and being able to put on siding and changing out the windows. But what that did is it made them not as historically significant because the integrity of the building changed. And because of this sort of institutional racism of preservation, frankly, it stops those communities from having access to funds and support to uh, be able to rehabilitate these properties. And so that's another area in which we need to make some reform and some changes. How do we support faith communities in, in being able to rehabilitate their buildings and uh, revive them as centers of activity of, of many kinds for their communities? Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was one of the disappointments I had when we put the Odom Homestead on the National Register. The original plan was for the whole community to go on the National Register. Yes. But unfortunately, because the churches had been changed so much as Andrea just said, that there was no significance left in any of those three buildings enough for it to be, and, and those churches would have been the keystone to the whole community be, being listed. And so the only um, uh, land, uh, project or, or buildings left were in the Odom Homestead that had not been changed or mm -hmm. had not been altered so much that they could not, um, wouldn't make it onto the National Register. So that is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. If I could piggyback off of that a little bit, uh, Loretta and, and, and Dr. Roberts. Um, our organization applied for the Dixie Community and Historical Marker, and it was awarded in 2019. And we are hoping that that historical marker keeps that community together. Because like to say it earlier, when, usually when the church dies, the community dies. But all of these folk are still living in that particular community. And if we can just gather pride about our community and what this marker means for the historical significance of that particular community, then we're on our way to something, I think. Yes, yes. Right. Now, I think you, the, the most important thing you're saying is you're on the way to something. It's a process. Yes. Uh, everything is an, a long, ongoing uh, freedom struggle, right? <laughs> just like the rest yeah. of our freedom struggle. That's right. I just want to thank you all so much. Um, I think there was something really particular about, um, there is something really particular about the way Texas, the way you folks from Texas seem to, um, you are so specific about pride of place and you are so precious about protecting what is um so rightly yours and um and that posture is really inspiring to see. Um hope you I think they will have um linked some of folks's or some of um Ms. McCray and Ms. Clay's um information in terms of their, their projects, but certainly you can find and go and find these beautiful people out in the world that donate and help and support the work they're doing. I just thank y'all for being with us. The Schomburg is always a place um for loving on and, and sort of celebrating Black life. And it's just been wonderful to, to hear your stories. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Therese, for such a beautiful conversation. Um, there were many questions that were asked in the um, chat section, but certainly people were asking to be able to learn more about Mr. McCray as well as Ms. Clay. So if there are websites, we will also include them 
uh, in the uh, maybe description of the YouTube uh, place where we have this video. Um, if not sooner, we'll put it in the chat as well. I also just wanted to mention, uh, Therese Nelson was with us a little bit at the end of last year with Dr. Monica White and Leah Penniman talking about uh, black farmers. And one of the things Dr. White mentioned was that too often we over elevate the work of academics uh, with the folks whose work and labor we could not do without. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Roberts for introducing Fred McCray and Loretha Clay to the conversation. It was so great to hear from them specifically about the work that they are doing for the communities that they were raised in, where they still have family. Um, and that pride in place that Therese mentioned, I think we should all find that uh, wherever we are uh, on this planet, pride in place, but also the freedom to be prideful of those places. Thank you again. We'll drop in the comment section again the link to the Texas Freedom Colonies Project so you can learn more about that. Now we are going to turn to the last segment of the program. I promise you, you will have treated yourself to the wonderful end of this program. As many of us have been without our rituals for mourning and celebration during this time of quarantine, we will now hear from the brilliant musicians and co-founders of Rootstock Republic, Juliette Jones and Jarvis Benson, who have arranged a sonic experience to hold space for these competing emotions. So please welcome Juliette and Jarvis. Thank you so much, Novella. Uh, peace and happy Juneteenth. Peace and happy Juneteenth. Um, thank you for that incredible introduction. Thank you to the Schomburg Center for welcoming us back. We are Juliet Jones and Jarvis Benson, the co-directors of Rootstock Republic. Um, Rootstock is a string production company that centers black and brown string players and creates dynamic platforms for us to be seen, heard, and celebrated. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. And one of our, our um, company's curated works is um, Dear Nina, and it's a sonic love letter to Nina Simone. Um, and this work was built in collaboration with our dear friend and sister, Drea Dunor, who's a powerhouse visionary, singer, songwriter, activist, pianist, and so much more, um, based out of Western um, New York. Um, the project is a reorchestration of about 15 of Nina Simone's love songs um, blues and protest music, and features some of our dearest, dearest, dearest colleagues and so fortunate to call family. Um, of course, Juliet Jones, myself, um, Jarvis Benson, Monique Brooks Roberts, Mark Malcolm Parson, um, Chris, bass player, player Johnson, bass player, player is very important, and um, Riza Printup and Drea Dunor. Um, and in this um, set, um, it includes um, Strange Fruit, and um, it's Strange Fruit, of course, is one of the most um, um, iconic songs of the 20th century civil rights movement. And as we know, um, it was made famous um, by Billie Holiday and adapted by Nina Simone. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Jarvis. Um, one of our commitments in the project um, was specifically to bring on uh, black and brown string players, in part because that's our our mission and our legacy work inside of our company at Rootstock, but also uh, many folks know that uh, Nina Simone was classically trained and she defined that, uh, that genre, if you will, um, by her own standards. Um, we really believe in that, the innovation of creating our own. Um, and so for us, it was really important uh, to uplift Nina's love of not only Black people, but of classical music and Black people through the, uh, the avenue of expressing what we need to say through that, that, that avenue of classical music. And so um, that's part of why our instrumentation includes uh, really a string sextet um, with vocals and piano. A lot of the orchestration was written um, through the, the lens of multiple styles and genres because it was important for us uh, to feel like we had full range uh, of our instruments and our voices and of our ancestors' stories and the songs that we know are part of our, our legacy. Um, it was important for us to always feel like we could access that through the music. And so um, you'll hear that later today, but uh, as Jarvis mentioned, um, you know, it's, it was really important for us to also highlight Strange Fruit. Um, the song is difficult to hear, even more difficult to play 
um, and we don't treat it as a performance. We, we treat our offering of strange fruit really as a ritual. Um, we know that the New York Times did, um, called it a, a declaration of war, really. Um, and we also feel very clear about the ways in which it was a, a crucial marker that helped to stamp the civil rights movement. And so um, as it was written in response to the lynching of Black Americans, my God, here we are more than 400 years later, uh, still fighting the American genocide against Black and brown bodies. Um, so thank you so much for taking that journey with us as we prepare to share our strange fruit with you. Absolutely, and, and, and one of the things, especially um, Nina Simone, I think left us with um, and charged us uh, with the choice and moreover the duty to reflect the times with our art. Um, and we really wanted to take this in, in to heart, um, sit with it, and we feel as though we're summoned by all of our ancestors to stand tall in that calling, to revel in joy as an act of resistance and survival, and to trust redemption when our humanity was ignored. Yeah, um, I uh, had the great fortune of being able to participate in a project with uh, my dear brother, Mark Bamuti Joseph, called Black Joy in, uh, in an Hour of Chaos. And in that work, um, he reminds us that joy is a human right, that spring is for the taking, and that joy in the living Black body matters. Um, through our work, with Rootstock Republic, through our, our work, through the vehicle of Dear Nina, um, we claim that birthright to be our very own, and we fight forward for the justice and liberation of all Black bodies. So we created a visual experience to accompany our performance of Strange Fruit. Um, and the recording that you will hear is from our last year's inaugural Sing Singing Nina Festival in Germantown, um, Philadelphia. Um, and as Juliet said, this video is our reflection on um, Black remembrance and Black joy. Um, the full premiere of um, this visual experience will be available to all of you um, exclusively after um, the celebration on Dear Nina YouTube channel. And the link will be shared directly um, with you by the Schomburg team. Lastly, we want to thank our Schomburg family for welcome us, welcome, welcoming us back and organizing this very, very special event in celebration of Juneteenth. And without further ado, we're thrilled to share a live recording of Strange Fruit with you. Thank you.
southern trees.
I think we all just need a moment to uh, sit with that feeling. Thank you so much, Juliet and Jarvis and the many members of Rootstock Republic who made that recording. Uh, you can actually access the visual experience now if you are watching this particular program, you have exclusive access before 4 p.m. So see the link that was dropped into the chat uh, to experience it in full. I'm still, every time I hear it, I get choked up but I am grateful to the artists who are often making that good trouble. I am thankful to the audience who is here joining us in this space to commune, and I hope that each of you will find a way to commune and find rest and find joy or protest, whatever it is that you want to do, whether or not it's virtually or in person, I hope that you do it safely. I want to say thank you to those who are behind the scenes, Thank you, Kalila and Tally and Serena and Dave and Aiden. An immense gratitude to our participants, Carla Hall, Therese Nelson, Brittany Renee Robinson, Robinson, Dr. Andrea Roberts, Fred McCray, and Loretha Clay. I'm so sorry, Brittany, that we were not able to bring you back at this time, but I am sure that we are going to be able to do a special post so that they can hear the beauty of that voice that they already started to hear when we began this segment. Thank you for spending part of your Juneteenth with the Schomburg Center and the New York Public Library. And also one more group of people that I forgot to say thank you to, but certainly they are my colleagues. They are our archivists and our librarians who often make these items available in the Schomburg Center as Dr. Roberts talked about, they are the people who help to preserve these Black histories They make it accessible to willing and thoughtful and empathetic scholars who are able to tell these stories out into the world because we know that there are more than one story for each individual and for this tapestry that we call a Black community. So in closing, I'll leave you with this brilliant poem, The Second Sermon on the Warp Land by Gwendolyn Brooks. I won't read it all, but simply she writes, No, the whirlwind is our commonwealth, not the easy man who rides above them all. Nevertheless, conduct your blooming in the noise and the whip of the whirlwind. I definitely recommend reading the entire poem. You can find it out on the internet. But until then, thank you for joining us here at the Schomburg Center virtually in the New York Public Library virtually. Please find us online at nypl.org and find many, many resources at nypl.org slash Juneteenth 2020. Stay well. <laughs>